Welcome to The Heart of the Matter, an Our Place podcast where we look at the issues surrounding homelessness, addiction and mental health on the streets of Greater Victoria. Welcome to Heart of the Matter, an Our Place podcast. Today I am welcomed by Dr. Julian Summers, a clinical psychologist and professor at Simon Fraser University, who specializes in the treatment and prevention of addiction. Um, For the readers that might not um, know you or know your reputation, could you tell us a brief overview of your your work in this field? Sure, it's great to be with you, Grant. Thanks, and thanks for that question. The, um, yeah, I I started a a fair number of years ago, I'm afraid to say. Um, It was in the mid 1980s and I was working at Riverview Hospital. and my academic mentor um, was a guy named Bruce Alexander, who worked in the area of addiction and had run a series of experiments that are known as the Rat Park studies uh, for people that are, are sort of in this in this field. And I was I was fu- right away fascinated by uh, addiction because then um, it, it was uh, a, a very uh, little understood phenomenon. Um, the, the 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 thinking across the board was that people became addicted to various things because of something some fundamental difference that they had in their brain and that they remained addicted because they were um, unwilling or incapable of tolerating withdrawal symptoms. And so it was this vicious cycle all set off by some kind of brain abnormality. And even then there was really no evidence to strongly suggest those things because people were quitting heroin and some would go through withdrawal, but some would say oh, that's like sort of a flu. Yeah. And um, and the same with alcohol. People were so there were people were, were were quitting drinking all over the place without treatment, which was thought to be impossible. And um, and then some would not only stop drinking, but then they'd start drinking, but they'd say actually the way I drink now it's not like that. So they're they've become um, what were termed controlled drinkers, and all of these things were deeply divisive when the f- in the field. Some people would say, you're lying. You're making that up. It doesn't happen. It can't be. So I was fascinated not only by the phenomenon, but by the culture of addiction. And I, I thought I was coming along at the right time because I believed that, oh, this is good because somehow in, during my career, we're going to sort out all these things. We're not going to behave to each other like, like this anymore. <laughs> and, and we'll be able to move on and, and use some of the knowledge that was already becoming apparent, which is things like people quit people quit when meaningful parts of their life change um, and literally they have better things to do that's part of what was shown in bruce's rat park studies that rats in social settings um, showed a strong preference for food over morphine solution but if you put them into isolation they switched and you could switch them back and forth if they came they and so even if they became dependent um, they they needed more to they they ingested more, presumably having become tolerant, um, and then put them into Rat Park. They would stop. Contrary to this withdrawal is driving addiction theory. So it was all very, it was just really fascinating uh, stuff at the time. And in some ways, uh, we haven't really progressed too much at all. At least in how we support you know people who are living in poverty and who have addictions. Uh, we 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 really haven't absorbed much of what we knew even back then. Yeah, because it's interesting. I mean, um, you know, I tend to see on the streets right now a lot more psychosis. And and yet the people who are testing the drugs are telling me, you know, yeah, maybe the drugs are stronger because of fentanyl and stuff like that. But they, but like, for example, crystal meth hasn't changed that much. And yet we are, so they're kind of in denial about the psychosis we're seeing. You know, but but we're we're seeing it. We know it's there, but it's like there doesn't really seem to be an answer. No, and you know we've we've focused a lot on um, on answers that are very close to the um, you know the 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 scene of the crisis. Um, so we we focus on. Um, obviously, if there's a, a, a poisoning and someone needs resuscitation, we have naloxone. Now, now anyone who's even remotely in contact with, with addiction, um, if they know one thing, they know about naloxone. 
yeah. and hopefully they also know how to administer naloxone, right? Because so, but that's where we. So, but but how many people have been you know focused in an equally intensive way about how how do we prevent addiction? Yeah. Right. Almost nobody. No, we don't. Yeah. It's not even. We and it's and it, and the excuse is always well, we don't have time for that. Well, um, we need to make time for that. Um, because the, 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 the focus on harm reduction, and this was my, so after, after working with Bruce, I worked with a guy named um, Alan Marlat. Alan wrote the book called Harm Reduction. I came along when he had returned from Europe and he was just smitten with this approach that they were taking, which involved meeting people sort of in need. This is during HIV AIDS. This is like late eighties, early nineties. And they were doing things like handing out needles at, 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 at night in uh, um, in sex work areas and uh, places where people were really very vulnerable and um, stuff that could not be done in the States, which is where we were working at the time in, in, in Washington. So so he brought this idea back and, and we ran with it because it's, you know, it's, it was it was fantastically important um, and 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 represented something new. There was, you know, there was something we could do. We could this this whole concept in addiction of meeting people where they are. I know it sounds like, of course, you should, everyone should do that, but we don't. We still don't do it. Um, and back then it was even less common. So, you know, we got we that area has flourished, but it's become a, now a bit of a behemoth. Um, harm reduction, I mean, because if you know, if you think about well, so what what is harm? Well, I think about harm reduction in, in another context. If if you want to get in great, you know, shape physically or something like that, you want to just feel really good in your skin and whatever that means to you, then you know you got to pursue that image. You go into the grocery store and you walk down the chips aisle and you see the ruffles and the Cheetos, things you used to buy, and you say, no, 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 now I'm not going to do that. Okay, that's harm reduction. You're reducing harm, but there's no amount of resisting Cheetos that is going to turn you into an Adonis. You need a vision of where you're going. What What's the plan? So, you know, we, we, we are rudderless now in this. We have people who are defending something they call harm reduction when really what they mean is it's what we do. Yeah. Um, so operating a consumption site, you know, if you if you if you talk about somehow doing us out of business, which is I think what most consumption sites actually wanted to do in the first place themselves. But if you talk about you know, taking away our funding or doing something else, you're against harm reduction. Well, I mean, no, not necessarily. Portugal made their their huge and much talked about turnaround without a single consumption site in the whole country. But that's only because they committed to providing homes for people. Right. Yeah. It's not against consumption sites. It's how are you going to address the harm of being homeless? And if you're going to address it by enabling people to continue to be homeless, but provide them with a place to safe, more safely consume drugs, that's one option. That's harm reduction. But if you're going to provide everybody with a home or, or, or a place such as a therapeutic community to then transition into a home, then it's not that you're against consumption sites. It's that you're for a different way of addressing the harm. Absolutely. And I think that's the same thing with, you know, the housing first model is that the housing first model was four stages and we stopped at stage one. And COVID really showed that because it shone a light. We housed a lot of people like our place housed over 500 people still does to this day. But that really sort of opened our eyes to, okay, we've got them in housing. We want to stabilize people. And I think you, you've talked about this in some of your studies, is that everybody's kind of mixed together. We have people who have severe addiction, people who have sustainable addiction, people who have severe mental health issues, people who are just, I guess, in poverty, just struggling, but they're all kind of in together. And it, and it's they're not escaping the trauma of where their addiction has led them or where poverty has led them. It's just... You know, they're building a community, but it's, they're not graduating to that next step. Yeah, we've, we've, we, I, it's, well, what, what you're describing is, you know, um, and I, I know some of the work of our place and, and I think, you know, and what you're describing there is toward the sort of the, 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 the better end of what um, uh, our not-for-profits, uh, which is the, really the backbone of, of community, you know, led, assistance for people um 
Uh, you know, we 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 talk about addiction. Oh, it's it's uh, we we like it's a ping pong match between justice and and medical care. So oh, no, it's not a it's it's not a justice problem. So someone someone gets on their soapbox, and you know we should we should not be treating this as a moral failing. It's a disease, and then you know then the the disease. The, the on the other hand, no, we need you know we need to clamp down. And and the truth is, it's neither of those. It's it's a um, it's it's a relational problem. Um, you don't treat it in a doctor's office, and you certainly don't treat it in prison. Um, but you, but, but the 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 answer is in communities. It doesn't involve professionals. The the sign you're doing better after addiction is that you don't have professionals in your life anymore. You're, you have a you know you have a, a, a life with people, and so the, that's kind of you know fortunately a great many the, the majority of people who wind up putting their addictions do not engage professionals and are not urged into it by the criminal justice system i'm talking about people who quit alcohol quit smoking quit heroin quit you know all sorts of things um but it but they have the good fortune to see that there are alternatives available to them in their in their immediate world interpersonal world and what we've done over time is produced more and more people, many come from our foster care system. Uh, in fact, 25% of the people we wind up working with who are deemed hardest to house were in care, which is an astonishing stat. It's like vanishingly below 1% of the population, but all share what we call adverse childhood experiences, which is um, uh, usually uh, associated with uh, various forms of trauma, but in a more sort of workaday sense, it's you, you. You've had very few episodes in your life where someone has said, you know, you're lovable, you're good. Here are some decisions to make about what to do next. Why don't you make the best decision you can and repeat, right? And they just and most of us have had that. The people we're talking about haven't. So with housing first, my friend Sam Simbaris, who um, I, I think coined the the phrase uh, in his work in New York. He tells the story that if you walk up to people and say, "Hey, um, I could, we can go and get coffee. Um, I know of, I know of a couple of places available that uh, where you could live because we you, we can see the person's homeless. Um, uh, people are available to help you get back into the workforce and or connect with connect with others. We can get your ID. You know, any of that sound good? And people, if you put people options like that, put those before them, they tend to choose housing first. But the, but the point was meant to be, it's about conferring in a sincere and meaningful way opportunities to express agency so that the person can design their pathway. And it doesn't happen overnight, obviously, but they can design their pathway to become members of communities. The 25% or so who have kids under age 18 invariably want those kids and reconnecting with them in some capacity to be part of their pathway. Others, but all, everyone wants to reconnect with 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 relations. Often, though, that process is fraught because the exit was not smooth. That uh, that's as often true for Indigenous people we've worked with, who yeah. really, in an obvious way, have a yearning for reconnecting with their culture, and yet the they've become estranged in in ways. It's and it's and it's it's for Indigenous people also to be in that intermediate space as well. But these also become opportunities if we can, if we recognize them. This is, but the way we're talking, Grant, it's just a whole different uh, way of understanding addiction than the one that's leading to what, what's, what we're calling safe supply and, and imagining the decriminalization as a grand you know, intervention is gonna result in some sea change for people because it, it really isn't. Yeah, and that's, uh, I was going to ask you about, uh, you know, safe supply and decriminalization because that definitely seems to be the way that we're going like the, this seems like the way the government's going um and yet i always see it as it seems to be short term thinking but but what are your thoughts so you know i've talked to you know yeah um mom stop the harm i mean and i mean it's heartbreaking when you hear about that but i always wonder you know Clean supply might have saved your child's life, but would it have brought your child back to you? You know, that's kind of my question. But what, what do you feel about uh, decriminalization and clean supply? Yeah, well, you know, referring to people who've lost loved ones um, is um, 
you know, it 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 it, it it's hard to say anything to and and expect that it's going to bring some peace. Um, uh, you know, given given that experience, um, and the and and the and the impulse to, you know, imagine a different, um, uh, a potential difference making, uh, scenario right at that you know key uh, fatal moment, right choice point. Yeah. That's that's certainly you know very understandable. Um, um, the rest of us, those that are not uh, um, immersed in grief, need to um, uh, need to think though about well, what about other implications of that? And it's 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 not only what you touched on oppor opportunity cost. What else could we be doing? But but also, what are some of the harms in the population elsewhere if we were to try and implement? A, uh, a pharmaceutical supply in the hopes of displacing um, illicit drugs. I'll, I'll add that the the Stanford Lancet Commission, which for me is 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 one of the the the, the most important um, recent documents, 2022 review of the opioid crisis in Canada and the U.S. A 51 page document. They outline a lot of things that we ought to be doing much more of. They caution strongly against profit seeking in the sector. They're they're referring to North America. They're not trying to you know pick. They're certainly not picking on BC, but they might as well have been. Um, and they say of of all the things that we ought to be doing more of. Again, like 50, 50 plus page report. Uh, here are two that that governments or people should be really skeptical of. One is providing drugs in vending machines. And the second is introducing a pharmaceutical supply in the hopes of displacing the illicit supply. Those are those are close to our number one and number two policies in BC. And I believe they are so because they make money for people who've influenced those policies. But back to what you know what we what we what we ought to be doing, um, the you know, and 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 how what's being called safe supply. I mean, the term itself, you know, should give people a little bit of pause. If they don't, if they don't have a dog in this race, they should hear something like that. I've never heard of it before. It has to do with providing opioids like like heroin. Yeah, not only that, hydromorph and and uh, and cocaine and meth, and uh, and it, and it's going to be taxpayer funded provision of those drugs to people with addictions who, if you own a pharmaceutical company, that's kind of like your dream client group, right? People with addictions, they, they need your product. They'll, they'll, they'll move heaven and earth to get it. And so, so somehow coming out of the oxy fiasco where governments where, where sorry, where pharmaceutical companies went under because of misrepresenting the potential harms of opioids. Now we come out of that and we have a radical expansion as though that never happened. It, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. There's no place else on earth other than BC that is doing this. And um, and most are in line with what the Stanford Lancet Commission has, has recommended. Um, in BC, no one is even willing to talk about this. And, and I've, I've unfortunately had the experience of raising my voice and ha having my you know, sort of metaphorical head shot off. Um, um, there's a real uh, intolerance and I, I think a sense of insecurity um, related to the policies that we're committed to. And, and, and I, I think people are, are becoming appropriately nervous that um, this could all blow up. What, why do you think there is resistance? I mean, uh, why, when you look at the Portugal model, and I know that in Portugal, recovery resources, mental health resources were a big, big part of what they're doing. Why wouldn't, why do you think we're not looking at that whole model rather than just taking one little piece of it? It's hard to answer. Um, uh, I can say, you know, having, because I've searched for answers to this um, and having worked with people in, in the provincial government, the federal government um, now for about 25 years, um, uh, you know the the elected officials change with them often uh senior public servants change too but there's um i i think the most likely explanations are that the people making decisions don't actually know what the active ingredients were in in portugal 
or or in general what the active ingredients are that contribute to people um, successfully overcoming addictions and experiencing much greater wellness. And the main thing I'm draw I'm referring to when I say addiction is the, is the is the experience people have. I've had this experience myself. i years ago um, of being powerless to control something that you know is self-destructive and and day after day week after week month after month same thing and and people start to distance themselves uh you you start to see you know people police start entering your life um it's not an uncommon story and um you know it's it's getting past that how do we help people get past that? And that's and that's really, I think, the crisis. There are different forms of addiction, uh, but but that's sort of the the form that I think is um, of, of greatest concern to us right now. Um, that that addiction that leads to real self destruction and then kind of community level destruction as well. Um, you know, um, others others are clearly harmed. So we we know how to address that. And you're you're right. The Portuguese. Um, they did a couple of things that we might need to do here in BC, um, and it'll take us a little while. First thing is coming to some consensus around what our vision is. And they came to the vision that, uh, and this is a quote, it's emblazoned in my brain now. There is, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as treatment without social reintegration. That, and they and so this is huge document actually a lot of it is about changes how the law changes to their law which was uh, the main thing that we've taken away is that they, they they changed from a possession from a criminal offense to an administrative offense being part of the european community they had a lot of thinking to do about how that was going to play out um but they did it so that police could actually have more involvement in uh the lives of uh, uh, people living on the street with addictions rather than less they were already ignoring them much as our police you know i mean not, not ignore but they've they've learned that there is there is nothing less that police can do that's going to improve things they've backed away as far as they possibly can yeah. the only way forward is for others to do more and police have been stuck in that space for years now in bc dealing walking a very delicate dance that Probably at times, if it was me, it wouldn't always bring out my best qualities because it's an incredibly frustrating work, right? To yeah. be re resuscitating people who are um, surviving on theft, right? So they're having to, and, and but they're dependent on that, right? And no one is going to, no one's coming along to divert them from that lifestyle. So what are police to do if they're attentive and, and know what's going on? You can't turn a blind eye, but you can't really change things much either, right? So, it, it's 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 just uh, you know, it, all of the, the, these dynamics are are have are having a, I think um, a, a real they're making a contribution now to um, tensions between institutions between peoples um, that that are you know I mean we've got to rein this in, um, uh, and the good news is we can. But there, um, there's resistance. I think part of the resistance is ignorance. Part of the resistance is, as the Stanford Lancet Commission really pointed out, profit seeking. We have real, we have uh, leaders in this province who are influencing policy, and who have obvious. Um, when I say obvious, they own pharmaceutical companies' um, interest in what's happening. So it's um, it, these are unfortunately things that pe more people need to become aware of so that we understand how we got here and how we can get out of here. Yeah, I, I often wonder, and I use this term sometimes, but you know, killing people with kindness almost feels like we have bent over backwards to, um, to let people make their decisions. But right now, death is no longer the bottom. You know, I know people who have miraculously turned their lives around after they've died for the third time from toxic drug overdose. But it's like when death is no longer the bottom, you know, when does the parent walk into the room and say, OK, enough is enough. We have to uh, to fix this. And I kind of feel like we're constantly in this uh, waiting for someone to make a decision that their addiction is fighting against them saying, no, we just, you know, we don't want to change. We, you know, 
it's, we like where we are. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it, it, the way. I mean, the way you describe that is fascinating, and sort of like waiting for a parent to come in. Um, the you know the the the. The, the the parent as 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 savior is is a is powerful because the parent has wisdom that the child doesn't. The parent knows ways of doing things that the child doesn't. And um, you know, in, and so in this context, we're talking about people who are at a loss in life. They're they're in complete disarray, and and we're bringing to mind that there is someone who knows ways of organizing a life and ways of and, and a way to a way to proceed and do that and that can and that can provide that and unfortunately we're missing that we don't we don't there is no real parent in this scenario it ought to be our provincial government in some meaningful way there ought to be a plan we recently heard our you know a budget uh, for the coming year we we fortunately collectively have a, a bit of a surplus but what we we're kind of what we were what we learned is is really there was no vision for a um you know a a, a better way of being us um it, it was completely absent um but but that's part of what the conversation we need to have one way we can uh as uh speaking for myself as a non-indigenous person one of the way all non-indigenous people i think can benefit from this is invest heavily in what indigenous people are asking for in terms of the resources to reestablish communities, um, because that focus on reestablishing re communities, which is which is by the way a, a very strong obligation in BC of all places on earth, because we are the last to resolve formally in a treaty sense relations between colonized and colonizing people. So we've got to, you know, we can't dither on this uh, the way we have been. But if we were to invest heavily in um, uh, responding to what indigenous people say they need to, to re-strengthen communities. That would go a long way toward um, providing opportunities for the disproportionate number of indigenous people who are in urban areas and homeless with addictions, because they would have stronger communities that actually very much want them to be members. That lesson uh, needs to radiate to every other community, um, and and to some extent we have it. And and there are there are more strengths in non-indigenous communities throughout BC than there are in many indigenous communities, which is why I I, I put the emphasis the way that I did. But but we have to we have to become more uh, attentive to what those strengths represent. Our um, you know our recreation centers are um, those should be the last to close in a pandemic, not the liquor stores, right? There should be the places where we can be together. And if we can't be together in some way that, that is provided for, what are some alternative ways? But don't let it simply be left to everybody to sort out for themselves. We need to be together. We need to be working together. And you know, a big part of what Portugal um, invested in were therapeutic communities. Places where I mean, there's a variety, but um, and I don't need to tell you this. You're 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 steeped in it, but uh, but for others, um, you know, they're they're they they come in in various flavors, but they but they tend to provide for the people who've been um, on their own for a number of years, um, maybe never had a family, maybe never really had steady work, an opportunity to become part of a a, a collective that's committed to um, a an approach to living and a, an approach to working. Most of the people we've worked with are in their mid thirties. They have decades of life ahead of them. Most want paid work and, and they're fully capable. So therapeutic communities are places where people can establish a sense of fellowship, a, a sense of traditions, um, a, a sense of who could, you know, the voice of a parent, what are some of the things if you could be, you know, um, um, shown, you know, a way. And um, and then they 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 tend to leave, but only when they have a, a fairly secure way of of um, making money for themselves and a place to go and live and a community to be a part of. Right? We can do that. We can do that. Yeah, and I think that I mean our, our new roads therapeutic recovery community. You know, that's the hope end of our spectrum. And uh, the guys that are in there, it's a nine month to two year program. Um, 
And the results are remarkable. And it's community focused. I mean, it's it's the peers. I mean, they're listening. There was a, a I just interviewed um, a graduate who's now working for the Coast Guard, you know, and he had sort of lost his family and his life was right downhill and he spent 10 months at New Roads and now he's working for the Coast Guard and doing really well. And it, it's just so hopeful and, and wonderful to see. But, you know, and as he's talking about it, so much of it is that peers, you know, the, the peers together, they're talking about their traumas and stuff like that, but that positive influence they're getting from each other. There was a young, a young man who's off getting a face tattoo lasered off because it's highly offensive, but that let him fit in with the group he was with. It wasn't a good group for his, for life. But, and now he's with a more positive group and he's like, yeah, I want to make this physical transformation as well as the internal transformation you know, and so we really see the the hope there, and we're um, hoping that the government will will fund it for us. Um, but the uh, but it's it's all about that community. Now, of course, we've got a second stage house they go to when they graduate. So we've got it so that when you leave, you know, you've got a place to live, you've got a job, you've got reconnection with your family. If that's a positive thing for you, a lot of times that's the motivator for so many of these these men. So it is, but and then the skills necessary to maintain all of that, you know. And I, just when I see when I talk to the guys when they graduate, see that because it really is like a physical and mental transformation that you see, and you're like, oh my god, why aren't there a hundred of these, you know, all across BC? It's it's quite remarkable to see. With with any luck, we'll we'll have as many as we need for everybody that can benefit from them, and then um, we'll you know we'll we'll move on to um, we'll repurpose them. Uh, that's actually the, a conversation they're having in Alberta uh, already. Um, they've they've in, implemented um, seven hundred and fifty. Uh, Therapeutic community units, therapeutic living units, and uh, there are more online, and they're they're available for free, and and it's uh, you know immediate access, um, all uh, along the lines of um, vocational readiness. Uh, units for men, units for women. There are I forget the number, but there are indigenous uh, run uh, uh, communities as well. And um, the conversation was, what are we when we no longer have people who need therapeutic communities? What are we going to use them for, right? Mm -hmm. But then everybody realized, wow, what a wonderful problem to have! <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That'd be great, great problem. So, um, yeah. yeah. So just to wrap up, uh, I got a few minutes left here. Um, what kind of advice would you have for an organization such as our place that is, you know, we're serving over a thousand meals a day to people on the streets. We have a therapeutic recovery community for, for 40 men. We're kind of doing all the same, but what kind of advice would you see us as we head into this uh, 2023, 2024? Well, the, the, probably the first, uh, um, and this is, thinking from a from a, a, a clinical perspective is um make sure everybody is taken care of all the people who are providing care make sure all of them are are supported these are um extraordinary times to be um called on as a caregiver um in in you know in in the fullest sense of of what that means and uh um so you know Looking after each other and ourselves is is uh, the first priority. Uh, put your oxygen mask on first. Um, but in relation to sort of broader discourse, I think um, uh, looking for opportunities to um, ally organizationally and individually with um, movements that um, represent sound. Uh, progress into the future. So we don't, for instance, have communities of practice in BC between uh, not-for-profit agencies, other than those that exist informally. And and I think, um, you know, and as a result, that means that um, organizations need to provide their own um, employee professional development. They need, and, and, and you can, you know, this is for people listening, um, you can imagine the, the you know, the diversity 
of uh, standards and approaches and just a means, the ability to do that. And so, you know, any anything that can allow us to, to uh, pool, concentrate the opportunities for professional development centrally so that they build on the best knowledge of contributing of contributors to that that endeavor, which would be drawn from the not for profit sector, but but basically so that everyone gets the benefit of what the best of what's available, um, that everyone is able to provide similar standards of, of support no matter where they work, uh, because we meet people in and I meet people in downtown Vancouver or or um, in, in the region who want a service that's available locally, they become stable there, they want it, they, they're not from here. 85% of the people we've worked with were not in Vancouver even 10 years earlier. Um, they migrated from around BC, and this is while they're homeless. Um, but they so they want to relocate. But right now our 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 not-for-profit sector is 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 supported so diversely that we can't assure someone that they can go to Williams Lake from Maple Ridge and receive something similar, right? Like there's just, that's, that, that's, that's fanciful. So working together toward, um, you know, um, also being able collectively to use the knowledge that exists in the not-for-profit sector among, among people providing services so that the one, so that the people who are least well off are um, not only supported in, in ways that Need, need to have gaps filled, like therapeutic communities, but so that the people in our not-for-profit not sector are able to provide the, the quality of service that they're capable of consistently across different uh, organizations, and yet are very rarely funded to do. You've been listening to the Heart of the Matter podcast. For more information about our place and the vital programs and services provided to the Greater Victoria community, please go to www.ourplacesociety.com. Our Place is a registered BC charity. You can donate by visiting the website or by calling 250-940-5060. Help us to bring hope and belonging to those in need.